just wanted to show you a little scenery one more time. There's a gator right down there. Scared the crap out of me. <laughs> He's underwater right now. I so said you can't see him. But I'm glad that uh, he didn't come out. <laughs> I'm glad I scared him as much as he scared me. Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. October 15th, 2024. Let's get into it. I, uh, you know, I don't know if you, if you're obviously watching this, you, I, some people might be on YouTube. I'm not sure where John, this is John Williams, his show. He was, uh, down in, uh, Florida, you know, at some of the places that have been hardest hit and he was showing the real estate down there. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just destroyed. You know, I did a video on, on that, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But, you know, one of the things he was talking about, you know, these, these places, they can't be rebuilt. There's no way. I mean, it would cost, I mean, can you imagine how much the materials would cost in today's dollars with inflation? You know, oh my God, in some of these places were $600,000 homes. You know, even though they, they didn't look that great to me, you know, but I mean, hard to tell from the rubble, <laughs> you know, but, but anyway, he's, he was saying, you know, that, and of course, insurance is just going to be impossible now in Florida, but he was saying how, you know, places like Black Rock and all that are going to come in and buy up the property. Well, maybe so, but, you know, I want to refer you back to a video that I did, and my suggestion is to have the state of Florida, and he didn't mention this, I think I'm the only one that's proposing this. The state of Florida, to, to help people out, most of all, needs to go down and give them a somewhat fair price. Because the insurance ain't going to, many of them didn't have insurance. Okay, so they're completely wiped out at this point. And so those that did, you know, as, as, as I showed you, it only pays $250,000. And then, it, uh, and, and of course, $100,000 for belongings. So, you know, these people with $500,000, $400,000 homes, they're still at a huge loss. So the only way that we can really help these people get back to some semblance of a of life is for the state to buy up the property. And what I was suggesting was turn that into natural areas, recreational land, make that a buffer between us and the ocean. Okay, so that when these floods, these hurricanes come in, you know, and that way these 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 charlatans, these these hacks at Black Rock can't go in and rape and pillage these people because they're going to give them pennies on the dollar. For this property so anyway i just wanted to refer to you to this is john williams the next video i did you know i tell you i, I, I was putting away I, you know i just kind of cut the tv on and i fish around and i say oh you know what this looks interesting and george gammon just did a uh, a video i had no idea so here's some news for you you probably know nothing about do you realize china is in a major financial uh, meltdown at this point their real estate market is down 30%. Now, Chinese real estate is the largest asset in the world. Okay, it dwarfs anything. Losing third, I mean, can you imagine? 30% of a six, their housing market, $60 trillion. $60 trillion. Hell, our budget deficit is only 30, well, maybe 36 now. I don't know, 36 trillion. I mean, that's, that's just, that's $13 trillion that just got evaporated. Can you imagine all those homeowners in China, what they're going through right now? And what that's going to mean to the world economy? You know, what goes around comes around. That's coming our way. You think real estate ain't going to take a hit in the United States? Let me, let me give you, just to give you the magnitude of this crash. That's half, half of the entire United States stock market. So imagine, I mean, that's including NASDAQ, everything. Russell, I mean, imagine all of those indices cut completely in half, which is going to happen anyway, but I mean, but still, you know, we haven't hit it yet. Oh my God, and I didn't even know anything about it. I was just kind of fishing around. I was like, son of a bitch, that is crazy, isn't it? So anyway, I wanted to hit with the, the two topics that, uh, you know, to start out was the real estate, because then I... If you, if you go back and find that video, I think it was two videos ago, maybe three, you know, forward that on to DeSantis. We need to get, and I, I, I'm going to email him when I get home. I just thought of that right now and email my congressman and say, look, you know, as a state, we get all of our income from mainly tourism. 
in, in sales taxes. Okay, we don't have income tax in Florida. But I mean, I'm gonna tell you that the tourism is still gonna be here. I mean, it's a perfect day. It's a little warm today, but not bad. Okay, and we could take, and we got a surplus right now. Let's, let's help these people out, man. Buy up their property. Don't let BlackRock go in and, and rape and pillage these people. Come on, Florida. Come up to the plate. Go down there, buy these properties. Turn them into natural areas. And you know, someday, if you wanna sell it back to the private market, you know, when, when the currency has crashed and the dollar's gone and everything, you know, we, we've established a whole new monetary system, hopefully we're gonna join BRICS. And that's gonna be a huge topic of conversation today, which is the BRICS, and it's coming October 17th. There's a lot of things you don't know about BRICS. And uh, I'm gonna tell you, you know, we went, all right, let's, let me give you a little historical background before, because I wanted to talk about this. The central bankers have been in control of the world for five centuries, 500 years, okay? It wasn't until our forefathers came across the sea and settled in the United States and established their independence from those central bankers that run Europe, ran Europe at the time that one nation under God, indivisible, became free of the central banking system. Okay, and man, oh man, were they pissed off. That was the War of 1812, okay? They, they, they weren't gonna put up with that, but luckily we won again. So, you know, forward all the way up to around 1913, when the Democrats got control of the presidency. And that corrupt son of a gun, Woodrow Wilson was in there, and of course, the, 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 uh, the central bankers have been worming their way into the United States political structure, because you gotta remember, you know, they're still extremely wealthy over in Europe. And you know, you see what our government is now, we have nothing but evil, corrupt people for the most part, especially every single Democrat is a grifter you know, in, in the Congress. So, you know, people are easily bought. And that's what they did. They bought Woodrow Wilson. And that's when we brought in the Federal Reserve. And that was the end of the United States. As we know it, the central bankers took control. The Federal Reserve, a private bank, was established. Okay? And since then, we've been mainly, especially after Brick and Woods, up in, what was it, 1954, 56? I can't remember the exact year when Bretton Woods was established. We went on to a central banking debt-based system. You know, the way a debt-based system is, is, you know, and we've been going out. And so what, what, the way the world has worked for 500 years, if you go back, is there's been one empire after another. Now, the reason for that is, is because the only way for this system, this debt-based system to survive, oh boy, I'm coming up on some water here. Let me navigate around this. Whew. Boy, I tell you, it's, it's still it's still pretty wet here, even, even this long. But anyway, so the only way for it to work is, number one, you have to have people borrowing, okay? So as long as you got new borrowers that can pay back the old borrowers and keep the system going, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme. And then, of course, what you do is you go out and you overthrow governments. Good God, how many governments? And so, and of course, the bankers, they finance empires. You know, there was the Portuguese Empire, the Spanish Empire, the British Empire, you know, and we what what they did was they turned their eyes on the United States after, you know, the British Empire went down, and they said, we need a new empire. So they turned us into the British Empire. <laughs> and, so, and that's why we have 800 bases all around the world, because we're there to subjugate people all around the world and steal their resources. We're stealing Iraqi oil. We're stealing the oil in Syria, you know, but that crap. And so what they wanted to do with the Ukraine war, why do you think they went all in? They know this system's coming to an end for the first time in 800 years. I mean, you are living in monumental times, people. There's nothing we've seen in the history of 800 years of life on this planet. This is the first time that the world may be free of the central banking system. This is huge. This is huge, and so BRICS is coming in on the 17th, and I took a whole bunch of notes. I actually had to go, boy, I tell you, I'm sure I'm on every FBI radar. <laughs> I, had to, I had to go to a bunch of Russian websites to get the information on the BRICS and then translate the Russian into English, but I got that for you. We're gonna, I'm going to do a sit-down when I get to There's a campground along the way, and I'll, 
I'm going to tell you all about what BRICS and what it means to the world. This is a whole new financial system. And it's, you know, it's, it's well underway. Now it's, I mean, you have to understand, BRICS goes way back. You know, it took, uh, well, you figure from 1913 to 1950, I want to say 54, it really took the central banks that long to get things all worked out on how they wanted their new debt bait system to work. So you figure BRICS, I know it started back, I want to say 2006 or so, and it just hasn't, you know, gotten much traction since then. A little bit here and there. It wasn't until, because the central bankers, they knew they had run out of places to exploit. Okay? I mean, you know, the, there's only so many places you can steal the resources from. You know, the, the French have been thrown out. Of course, there was the French Empire. I forgot about that one. <laughs> they used them for a while. You know, uh, all these poor people that died as a result of the central bankers. But anyway, so... Uh, I lost my train of thought, but let's get some more hurricane damage. Look at that. Just ripped it right off of that tree right there. All the way over there. Huh. Isn't this beautiful? I love Sunny Hill. This is, I'm still at the beginning of the hike. All right, let's get back into where I was. So, they knew the system was crashing. 2008 was pretty much the end of the Ponzi scheme, the debt-based system. They pulled some shenanigans. They ripped off the American people, made sure the central bankers were taken care of, bailed out all the banks. Nobody went to jail. Nobody was punished. Nobody, nothing, nothing happened. Bush went along with the whole thing, that corrupt son of a gun. And the American people were blind to what was going on. But anyway, we've been, we've been on life support since then. And so, come all the way up. Now, I don't know what uh, the whole uh, COVID thing was all about. I mean, it seemed to me they were just trying to establish authoritarian rule, but it backfired on them. I think most people know now what really took place. Can't talk about it on YouTube, but uh, you know, we, we, we almost lost our, all of our freedom, but the world, that's what gives me hope. Gives me hope as the world is coming back to life People realized what a psyop that was, and I think now, you know, more people than, than less have come around to understanding what took place, and hopefully we'll never let that ever happen again. And not, the globalist almost took over the world. Had uh, Hillary Clinton won the election in 2016, I dare say we'd be living in an entirely different world. We'd be living in that 1984 dystopian world. You know, oh well. All right, so let's keep going on what, what has happened. So in uh, 2014, the United States, uh, we looked around. We said, well, what, what more can we steal from the world? And uh, so they said, well, you know, Russia is just a, a, a gas station. Let's, uh, let's balkanize Russia and we'll use Ukraine as a battering ram. But first, we got to go in there. You know, they got a bunch of Nazis in that country. I bet that we can overthrow that fr Russian-friendly government and install our own government. And that's what happened. So they stayed to coup. Russia immediately realized what had happened, and they invaded and took Crimea. And that's, uh, that's where things have been for many years. So in the meantime, and, you know, everybody says, well, why didn't Russia keep going? Well, they were too weak back then. They didn't have, and, and Putin was still consolidating his power. You know, Russia, people, people don't understand, it is actually a democracy. I mean, Putin can be voted out. You know, it's, it's not, everybody thinks it's an authoritarian. Now he's, believe me, they're, they're, their government's structured differently than ours. If Putin wants somebody dead, they're dead. <laughs> of course, that's true over here. You know, if, if the federal government wants somebody dead, look at uh, Gonzalez. Up in Ukraine, they let him die in uh, Ukraine prison. They could have gotten him out any time. So don't tell me our, our U.S. government doesn't kill people all the time, U.S. citizens, or put them in jail. Look at what they did to Julian Assange. Oh, yeah, I'm just giving you two examples. Good God, there's hundreds, thousands of Americans that have been punished. Hell, uh, what is it? Steve Brandon is in, still in jail for what two more weeks? Don't tell me that wasn't authoritarian. You know, look at Mayorkas. He's lied to Congress 16,000 times, and Steve Bannon just didn't show up, and they put him in jail. You know, look at January 6th. I mean, I just go on and on. January 6th was a setup. 
you know, the Pelosi could have called out the, the National Guard. Russia, uh, Trump offered him up. There's a whole movie now. Go to Babylon B. Watch January 6th. I can't remember. The, the, the worst day in the world or whatever. <laughs> whatever. I did a video on that. Anyway, getting back. So what the, the, the goal was is they were going to use Ukraine as a battering ram to break up and vulcanize. Because uh, Russia's got vast resources. And if they could have vulcanized that, they could have kept this debt-based system going for quite some time. But Russia, you know, they realized what was happening. And it wasn't until, uh, and you know, he, uh, the Burns, the guy that's in charge of the CIA, you know, he was he was actually the ambassador to Russia at one point. By the way, the, there is no Russian ambassador in the United States. Make of that what you will. I mean, things are getting tense, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. I mean, real tense. So hopefully I... Uh, we're all going to be alive a few more years from now. I don't know. I think that uh, in the next couple of months, if we can make it through that, we may all be okay. But the next couple of months, I, I'm, I'm serious. I, I think we we could very well see global thermonuclear war. And I'll give you the reasons for that in a minute. I, sorry, I got off on a tangent on what I'm going to be talking about. So anyway, so Russia, when, when they said they were going to bring uh, Ukraine into NATO, you know, knit means knit. That's when Russia said, oh... Hell no! We're not putting up with that. They sent in a force and, you know, the rest goes on from there. They sent in a token force. They went all the way to Kiev. You know, they thought they were going to get an agreement. Uh, Ukraine was ready to sign a peace treaty, basically, you know, saying that they would remain neutral and not join NATO. And then, of course, uh, uh, Johnson, that idiot in the United States, they went in there and broke up that whole peace agreement. And then the war went on. But they thought they could win it. So they put every sanction known to mankind <laughs> on Russia. They thought they would bring down the, the Russian financial system, which would mean Russia couldn't fight the war. Unfortunately, because Russia is so rich in natural resources, and they had other people like India and China and other nations all around the world that wanted to buy the, their, their, their resources, uh, Russia survived just fine. Nobody anticipated that, including Russia. I mean, I... Putin's already admitted, he said he, they were thinking that it was going to be a whole lot worse than what it turned out to be. And they never thought they would be, you know, recovered into a, a boom. Their economy's booming right now. Oh my God, we're going to get into that when I talk about BRICS. But anyway, so the war's gone on. So now, the West went all in. Think about it. $250 billion in U.S. taxpayer money went to Ukraine. They, did, they pulled out the rug. They gave every weapon in the U.S. stock to Ukraine. Uh, Europe, Europe went all in. They're broke now. They, uh, uh, Britain, what, 61 uh, billion euros or something like that. I don't know. I mean, Europe went all in with, with billions and billions. The whole Western Central Bank system knew that it was going to die if they didn't win in Ukraine. And now they've lost. Russia's advancing everywhere. We got a million dead Ukrainians. Think about that. And I don't know how many dead Russians. I want to say about two... 200, 300,000 dead Russians. Nobody thought, I'm sure the Russians, you know, never thought that the war would go on this long or that Ukraine was so armed to the teeth and that they would fight as long as they have. I, I thought this thing would, was going to be over back in January of 2023. I mean, it's still going on, but it's over. It's over now. And they punched out all the electrical. So Ukrainians are going to freeze. And now you're going to have... You want to talk about a migration. All those Ukrainians are going to descend on Europe. I don't know what Europe's going to do with them all. What are they going to do? Shoot them at the border? You know, put up fences? I don't know. I mean, that's what Poland's done. I don't think Poland's going to be letting any in. But I think the, 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 the Baltic countries will probably let them across. And then they can just flow right across Europe like a plague. You know. Anyway, uh, I mean, I don't want to call the Ukrainian people a plague. But I'm just telling you that... There's no way Europe can absorb that. And Europe's broke. We're broke. Our whole financial system is going to collapse. And I mean, if you want to talk about the Great Depression, this is going to be beyond the Great Depression. This is the end of 800 years of central banking system. And this is the first time in 800 years that a whole new banking system that can't be stopped. You know, look, look at what they did. Libya wanted to get away from the dollar. We blew the, blew the crap out of Libya and killed Gaddafi. Uh, there was, uh, there, there's been other nations that tried to get out from underneath the dollar. We went in, bombed the hell out of them, 
and I and told them, hell no, you you got to trade in dollars. I mean, don't, don't mess with the WEF. Those people are pure evil, man. And uh, but the WEF, they can't stop Russia, China, India, South Africa. You know, you name it. I mean, uh, the, all the, the big names are in there. And man, I'm, I'm going to be reading you some notes on what's going to take place at this conference here in just a minute. So anyway, I got some more talking points, but we'll get the reading here soon. I'm coming up on a campground and we'll continue the video there. As I come up on the campground, a little more hurricane damage, tree down over there, branches there. Well, let's make some good burning for some fires. And there's the there's the picnic area, the campground. More damage, more damage over there. All right, let's get to the reading. All right, let's get you all the information. I can't vouch for this information 100% because like I said, I had to translate it from Russian. Some of it didn't make any sense to me, so I just kind of put in the words that I think that it was meant to be. So BRICS is coming up October 17th to the 29th. The meeting, in, there's a meeting in Moscow October 17th and 18th and then Kazan October 17th to the 24th. So actually there's meetings taking place in both places. Uh, most most of the, con I'm not sure what the meetings, well, we're gonna get to what's going on in, in um, Moscow. There's also another, uh, the first BRICS Climate Congress is taking place at the Sirius Federal Territory on the 20th and 21st of October. I have no, I didn't even know they were in the, 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 the climate. Um, so uh, BRICS nations are gonna talk about the climate. Hey, all you lefties out there, <laughs> this this might turn you on to BRICS. All right, so uh, January 1st, Russia was passed the baton of the BRICS chairmanship. Okay, so it's January 1st of this year. That's why it's taking place in Russia. 15th uh, BRICS summit in August 2022 now includes uh, 10 countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates join BRICS Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa as full new members. Okay, the aspiration to form a multipolar world order and a fair global financial and trade system. So that is the goal of the BRICS. Okay, I mean, they put it right up on the website. I was like, wow, okay, they're, they're, they're saying they're going for the multipolar world and a new financial system. That's a, a fair fi global financial system. So, uh, of course, uh, and this is just reading from, from what that they were saying, of course, we will consider the degree to which many other countries, about 30 of them, are prepared to join the BRICS multi-dimensional uh, agenda in one form or another. To this end, we will start working on moldar modalities. I had to look up this word. <laughs> that is, uh, the definition is a tendency to conform to a general pattern or belong to a particular group or category. Uh, so multi, dual, <laughs> anyway, of a new category of BRICS partner country. Our priorities include promoting uh, cooperation in science, high technology, healthcare, environmental protection. Woo, nobody knew that BRICS was about environmental protection, did you? Culture, sports, youth exchanges, and civil society. Well, look at all the things that BRICS is about. I wish I could be there. And by the way, George Galloway's on his way there, so hopefully we'll hear from him about what takes place. In total, over 200 events of different levels and types will be held in many Russian cities as part of the chairmanship. So this thing's big, man. Big, 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 big. All right, the, the Kazan was chosen as the location for the summit is no coincidence. All essentials are in place for the city to host a meeting of world leaders. There is a well-developed transportation network, tourist infrastructure, and in general, a comfortable modern urban environment. The leadership of the Republic of Tartistan, I should say, has gotten the hang of it and was hosting international Fort on the four, and I, I couldn't translate, I couldn't figure out what the hell they were saying. I guess they were saying they'd hosted international stuff before, I think that's what that means. The steering committee keeps a close eye on what is being done to more than 50 city and other facilities for the accommodation of foreign heads of state 
and the government officials and their personnel. Great attention is paid to ensuring that the room stock should meet the standards and comfort and safety requirements. The local authorities are tightly secured in infrastructure in selected areas of accommodation to guests and in the courses slash education on the summits. So I imagine there's going to be material in the hotel rooms and there's going to be a, a bar and you know, you name it, these, these foreign dignitaries are going to be well taken care of. I can guarantee that. All right, so let's keep going. The leaders, the leaders negotiations and key talking points and lectures will all take place in the Kazan Expo International Exhibition Center. This is a unique one of largest, one of Russia's largest and most modern in terms of technical equipment. Can you imagine? I bet this Expo Center is, is bigger and better than anything in the United States. I wish I could be there. You know, back when I was in the computer world, I got to attend some of those uh, computer conferences at the Expo Centers. I bet this is going to be just as good or better. You got to go around all the, even the golf expos. I remember back when I could play golf before I broke my neck. So, um, all right, so let's keep going. Where was it? Kazan Expo was built to host large-scale events for thousands of guests. Just recently, I saw the coming of the Games of the Future. I have no idea what the Games of the Future is. Leave a comment below. By, by the President of Russia and a number of foreign heads of state. The compound is a five-minute ride from the airport and a 20-minute ride along the expressway from the center of Kazan. Free shuttle bus services will be available for all Kazan Expo throughout the summit. So in other words, I mean, you know these guys are going to be going out and they're going to be eating at the restaurants and touring around. It's going to be a, it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. I, God knows, I wish I could be there. Uh, many, many events have already taken place. So there's been a lot of stuff that's been going to build up to this. And I, 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 I'm not going to go into that because this video will get way too long. So the BRICS ministers... The BRICS Ministers Finance and Central Bankers Governors Meeting, the BRICS Senior Officials Meeting on Energy, Expert on Information Security, Anti-Money Laundering and Counterfeiting uh, and Financing, and the Youth uh, Financing, uh, there's a Youth Volunteers uh, Conference, and the BRICS Nuclear Medicine uh, have already working sessions, uh, have, those sessions have all taken place, okay? So think about that. And... All right, so on that note, now think about this. Russia's not even thinking about the war in Ukraine. And on that note, let's get into 10 myths about the war in Ukraine. So this is from Armchair Warlord. Uh, myth number one, any negotiations with Putin are an appeasement. The only route to Ukraine victory in this war is for NATO to go to war with Russia? Well, he says that will not happen. I'm not so sure. I think the central bankers are going to get very, very desperate. Very, very desperate. And that's why I'm worried about the nukes flying. Like McGovern says, that little mini nukes on the shelf right now, and they're, they're going to be mighty tempted. Ergo, our policy choice is to acknowledge Russia's victory now, appeasement, or to have them rub it in our faces later. In other words, unconditional surrender, and that's where we're heading. So there is no other way out other than nuclear war. Uh, number, myth number two, Russia is committing genocide in Ukraine. False. The UN has identified slightly over 10,000 civilians killed during the two and a half years of the war thus far. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian uh, language enjoys official status in Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Zaporozhye, and Tartar, uh, and Tartar in Crimea. Myth number three, Russian invasion was unprovoked. False. If the last two and a half years have shown us anything, it is that by 2022, Ukraine was an armed camp. I've talked about that many times. In fact, I just did. Good Lord, we had armed them to the teeth. Spoiling for a war and run by people with a fanatical hatred of Russia and the Russians. They're called Nazis. He didn't call it out. Putin gave Zelensky exactly what he asked for. Myth number four, Ukraines want to fight. False. Enormous numbers of Ukrainian men have fled the country, some of them paying eye water and bribes and facing great dangers. Rather than face the conscription and the Ukraine military is fed by press gangs ruthlessly sweeping for conscripts. 
And luckily he posted up a video and let's watch that video of them. This is just one video. There's a, there's a, cause I could have gone and pulled down 50 videos of them uh, pulling people off the streets and sending them to the front lines. But this is just his video. Они пацанов скрутили. Блять, это наши, это блять. Оле вы делаете? Myth number five: The Russians have taken enormous casualties in Ukraine. False. In real terms, the best data available, Medyazona's count of military obituaries plus published casualty figures from the separatist republics shows no more than 80,000 Russian military KIA over the entire world. I, I didn't know it was that low. Uh, uh, related talking point. The Russians have lost a huge amount of equipment in Ukraine. False. In real terms, the Russian military is far larger, far more lethal, and far better equipped today than it was in 2022, with the once rare vehicles like T-90Ms now quite common. True. That is absolutely 100% true, and the Russians are building up to a one2 million man uh, army uh, good lord what we've done what we've done uh, myth number six russians expected to take kiev in three days false and nonsensical this mimetic talking point seems to have originated with u.s army general and i'm going to add the traitor milly uh then c-i-c-s no Russian official ever made such a claim, nor did the Kremlin show any desire to overthrow Zelensky in 2022. This can be seen in the fact that the Russians started negotiations with the Ukrainian government immediately after invading. Why would they negotiate with people they planned to topple? Of note, the U.S. Army took three weeks to take Baghdad against a prostate Iraq in 2023. Okay, so there you go. Myth number seven. Ukraine is a victim of Russian colonialism. Nikita Khrushchev grew up in the Donbass and considered himself to be Ukrainian. Leonid Brezhnev was born and raised near Dripropetrovsk. Okay, you can you can read that for yourself. Both bought brought home a great deal of bacon from their their home SSR. Khrushchev gave, gave Ukraine Crimea, he didn't say Ukraine, in 1954. Myth number eight, there are no Nazis in Ukraine. Oh, come on. Ukraine's founding fathers, the Banderas and the OIJN slash IJPA, the Galatian SS, Nazis and Nazi collaborators, many implicated in the worst crimes of the Holocaust. Ukraine's most prestigious military units Packed to the rafters with Nazis. Okay, and we got another video. Well, no, we're not going to watch that video. Never mind. Myth number nine, Russia is an aristocracy. False. Vladimir Putin and the United Russian enjoy approval ratings among the Russian public that are extremely high, even in polling conducted by Western-backed and anti-Putin organizations. Putin is popular enough to win in any election held in Russia handily. Myth number 10, Ukraine is a democracy. False, the last free and fair election in Ukraine, not held under a unionationalist union jackboot after the 2014 coup was in 2010. All elections in Ukraine have been suspended in, since 2022 and Zelensky's five-year term from 2019 expired months ago. All right, so that's it. That's it for the Ukraine top 10. All right, so I'm going to get back out on the hike, but I wanted to read you a couple of uh, of uh, posts here. Um, I thought this was very interesting. This is from uh, Adam Media. Largest military in the Middle East. And I had no idea. Egypt. Egypt has 1.2 million. 
Iran at 1.18 million, Turkey at eight. You know, uh, McGregor always talks about Turkey and how uh, crazy their, uh, you know, their military size is. Says they're the largest in Europe. I guess they are. When you think about it, Iran and Egypt aren't in Europe, so uh, but 880,000. Israel, uh, 667,000. Saudi Arabia, 407,000. Iraq, 293,000. Syria, 270,000. UAE, 207,000. Jordan, 200,000. And Lebanon, at 160,000. So global firepower, 2024. Okay, the next one is uh, Peter Sweden. It's happening. The Italian right-wing government has sent the first asylum seekers, seekers on a ship to the center in Al Albania to have their claims processed. Italy is protecting their borders for the first time. The globalists are losing. The globalists are losing. Let's get on the trail. All right, good to be back on the trail. Get some other things to add to the video here. Uh, let's see, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, I told you I'm awful worried about the global thermonuclear war. And uh, I don't know if you knew, uh, there was a bombing well, of a hospital in, uh, in uh, Gaza. And I have a video on that. We're not going to get to that right now. But I'm telling you, these atrocities just keep piling up. And I'm not sure how long the world's going to put up with this. And uh, so, and also Israel says they're going to strike Iran. And then Iran strikes Israel back. And I mean, Iran says they're going whole hog. And if they do, Israel's going to let the nukes go. And if Israel lets the nukes go, I don't think Russia and China, you know, China, they get their oil from, from Iran. So you could see that that's one flashpoint for all-out nuclear war. Okay, and, uh, and of course we've sent over the um, what's it called the uh, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense (THAAD) T H A A D battery along with 100 Americans to Israel to man it. But for what reason? That thing only shoots 48 missiles, and if Iran launches, it's going to be Hundreds, if not thousands, of, of missiles coming in on Israel. I mean, Israel's going to get obliterated. I, I, I don't know how the world, or the, the West, doesn't see it that this is going to happen. And it's like the world, I mean, the United States. So this is, this, is, this is my slant on this. This is why I think we may end up all dead. Because the people, the globalists, the bankers that I was talking about, these are very, very evil and desperate people at this point. And who knows? I mean, they might just decide, you know what? If we can't be in charge, if we can't be on the top of the hill, let's burn it all to the ground. How many times have you heard people, they just want to watch the world burn? They just want to watch the world burn. Well, I think they, they may just risk, go all in, you know, with uh, it, this uh, exercise in uh, bombing Iran. And then and, and if we do survive and we don't have global thermonuclear war, the entire world economy is just going to be destroyed. Can you imagine no oil coming from the Middle East? I mean, gas prices. You, you, I mean, $100 a barrel. <laughs> we, we're going to shoot past that. Good Lord. I mean, I don't even know where the limit might be on the price of a, a barrel of oil. You know, I mean, it, it, and, that, and are they going to put up with Russia? Can you imagine the amount of money that Russia is going to make? Because they're what they... They would be the only and the biggest oil exporter in the entire world at that point. Which brings me to the second global thermonuclear war. As these globalists get desperate, and they realize they've lost, they've lost people, this is it. This is the end of the financial system that they created so that they could stay in power and rule the world. Their tenure is coming to an end. Now, it's not going to come to an end immediately, but the writing's on the wall. What are they going to do? Like I said, those little mini nukes could fly in uh, in Ukraine, right? So I'm 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 scared, man, and especially the BRICS coming up. I think they're going to do anything they can to disrupt BRICS. I mean, you know, you know, maybe in their thinking that they think they're going to be able to, uh, you know, just keep, uh, you know, the BRICS system from getting established. I mean, but even if they stop the conference, it's still going. You see how many nations are going to be there? 
I mean, good Lord. This thing, this, there's going to be, I mean, there's going to be more world leaders at this one event than probably since anything since World War II. I mean, this, this is a, this is huge. Oh man, I'm stepping in water here. All right, got to, got to work back around. Pay attention to what I'm doing. Let's keep going down the list here. Uh, oh yeah, let's get something cute. So, um, well, actually before we get to that, I got a video here. Uh, Korea, I mean, this is another flashpoint for World War. <laughs> oh my God. Korea is blowing up the bridges between them and South uh, Korea. Now, a lot of people are saying that that means that, you know, they're getting close to going to war. I, you know, I was kind of looking at it. It looked like they're bringing in a lot of equipment. Maybe they're just going to rebuild the bridges. <laughs> we, can, we can dream, right? But the fact that they've moved all their artillery, I mean, good God. I mean, somebody was listening. I want to say it was like 6,000 artillery pieces are sitting right on the DMZ. You know, they have a lot. They've always had a lot of artillery there. But, I mean, they've moved in a, a lot more. Why are they moving all their artillery to the DMZ? I mean, I guess they, they yeah, I don't know. You tell me. I mean, it seems to me that North Korea, I mean, this, this could be their opportunity. Think about it. The United States has given all its weapons to Ukraine and Israel. Okay, we're so depleted now, we're as weak as we'll ever be. There's no more greater opportunity for, for you, North Korea to, to bash the crap out of South Korea. And they're a nuclear nation. What are we going to do? Nuke North Korea? Everybody says, oh yeah, let's nuke them. Well, then, end of the world. Once again, end of the world. Because they got nukes now that can hit the United States. And if we nuke Korea, I don't think the Russians are going to sit by. And the Chinese, that's right on the Chinese border. You think the Chinese are going to sit there and watch Korea get nuked? I don't think so. And those 30,000 U.S. American troops in South Korea... I mean, if North Korea opens up with that artillery, they're all dead. They're all dead regardless of whether we got a nuclear war or not. Thank God I'm not in the U.S. military right now. We're under these freaking lunatic, warmongering, totalitarian, Marxist, communist Democrats. Oh, don't get me started. All right, so uh, let's get into a, a cute story. This was, uh, you know, if you didn't know, Barack Obama came out and he chastised all the black uh, people, the black men, said, you got to vote Democrat. What the hell's wrong with you? As he sits in this mansion, this $2 million mansion at Martha's Vineyard with nothing but white people. <laughs> He's going to come out and lecture black people who, who have been cut out because all the money the Democrats are giving it to the illegal aliens to buy their votes, and they couldn't give a shit about the black people. You know, unfortunately, the women, I guess women blacks haven't figured that out, but it seems like, like a lot of the male blacks are figuring out that they're not looking for them. I got a video on that. Let's watch this video. Hello, America, and hello, Georgia. I'm Vernon Jones, former state representative from the great state of Georgia, and I'm out doing my normal morning jog. By the way, it's a great day to be in Georgia. It's a beautiful fall day. But anyhow, I just had to pause for the cause. I, like many of you, observed and listened and watched Barack Obama last night as he addressed black men. But as a black man, he did everything but address us. What he did, he berated black men, he rebuked black men, he even scolded black men, primarily because we will not fall in line and vote for Madam Lockup or brother Kamala Harris, because that's her record. As if black men are too stupid that we can't vote ourselves interest, what's best for us, our pocketbook, our families. 
as if we've been immune to the past three and a half years, as if we don't know that gas prices have been higher on the Kamala Harris, food prices higher on the Kamala Harris, interest rates on home mortgages higher on the Kamala Harris, and runaway borders on the Kamala Harris. But you know what? That's what the liberal white Democratic Party did. They dispatched Barack Obama out there to whip black men back on the plantation to vote Democrat. And you know, President Obama, he meant a lot to black people, but he didn't do anything for black people. And for him to want to come down from his mansion in Martha's Vineyard and tell black men how we should vote, really? You don't even live in Chicago anymore. You left your black community, Barack Obama, and you want to tell us how to vote? We're not having that. And we're not voting for Kamala Harris. All right, so that, that was that video. Okay, uh, anyway, I just thought that was cute. Um, let's go uh, to, uh, actually we are on, oh yeah, here's another one. We got drones. <laughs> I mean, this is in the Wall Street Journal, man. The Wall Street Journal. So, I mean, you know, okay, I understand. Propaganda from the U.S. government, all right? Anything out of the Wall Street Journal I take is a lie or a, with a grain of salt. But I don't think they would write this unless it was true. They're saying for the last 17 days, there's been swarms of drones flying over uh, uh, Langley Air Force Base and other sensitive areas. Now, I don't understand why we're not shooting down the drones, other than we probably don't have anything there to shoot them down. We've given everything to Israel and Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, the United States is defenseless. I don't think we have anything here to really fight with. You know, we, we could go to Arizona and pull, pull all those old tanks and everything out of mothballs, but good Lord, how long would it take us to get them up and running? You know, I, I, not, none of them, I think, are going to do any good to shoot down these drones. Anyway, that's just another crazy story. And uh, cause is it, So does that mean we're going to come under attack here in the United States? It could. we got three million illegal aliens here. Terrorist groups roaming the United States. I mean, my God, I wouldn't be surprised to see our power grid go down. And, and cities in flames uh, within the next couple of months. I, I, boy, I'm a downer today, ain't I? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so we're going to finish off the video right here. Uh, there's a humanitarian crisis now in Lebanon, and I found a good video on RT. It's only about three minutes long. You can cut off right here if you don't want to watch these videos. They, they are depressing, but uh, I did want to start with the humanitarian crisis in, uh, in Lebanon. During the Civil War, Martyrs Square was the demarcation line dividing Beirut into east and west. In 2019, huge anti-government protests took place here. Now it is home to hundreds of families seeking shelter from the south, using makeshift tents, makeshift shelters and mattresses on the floor. The conditions here are dire, the stench overwhelming. Just yards away lies the Lebanese parliament. But the government remains in deadlock talks to end the paralysis have failed, hampering those relief efforts. Volunteers are filling the gaps, providing food, aid and medicine. Shipments continue to arrive for now, but the talk is of the port of Beirut being subjected to an Israeli blockade. Emergency measures are currently in place to deal with that scenario should it arise. The conditions here are so bad that many people have left, returning to the affected areas, including Becca in the east. Mohammed fled his home in southern Lebanon. All he has is a mattress and a parasol, offering minimal shelter. He's disabled, requiring daily medicine, but there's no government support. He says they are living like animals. Mohammed appealed to the international community for urgent support and to stop Israel's terror attacks. <laughs> I am here because of the bombing, airstrikes, and war in the area where we lived. We were forced to leave our homes and seek refuge elsewhere. We are asking Russia, as well as other countries like France and Italy, to help us return to our homes. We do not want war. We do not want shelling and destruction. Look at our lives. I had to leave my home, which was completely destroyed. I do not even have enough money to buy food. You can see for yourselves how we live. Winter is coming and we do not have a place to sleep. Children play as their parents appeal for food, desperate for anything to relieve their suffering. In the daytime, families lie in the shade to escape the sun with temperatures as high as 28 degrees. At night, they huddle together to keep warm.
Walid fled from the southern suburbs of Beirut, which had been bombarded by Israeli airstrikes and bunker-busting bombs. He's sleeping on the streets here outside the Mohammed Al-Amin Mosque, fearing he may never return to his home again. We had to flee the shelling and come to Beirut to seek refuge. We do not know how long this situation will continue. Winter is coming and there is no humanitarian assistance, not even a place to call home. Some people are able to rent a place, but others, like me, do not have that option. No one seems to care about us. More than 1.2 million people in Lebanon have been internally displaced, many seeking sanctuary in Beirut. But the government shelters are full to capacity, overcrowded, forcing thousands to sleep on the streets or in cars. Frustrations are boiling over. On Saturday, gunmen tried to take over a hotel, the situation brought under control by the Lebanese army. Beirut remains a city on edge. Thursday night's terror attack has heightened fears with no place in the Lebanese capital safe. As bombing in the south intensifies, Lebanon teeters on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. This is Steve Sweeney for RT in Beirut. All right, so that was that video. And then the final video of the day is a, uh, the Israeli Gaza strike on the hospital. It's about another three-minute video. If you want to know what, what, what happened, uh, this is that video. And that's why I waited to the end to put these up. Peace out. Stay free. We were sleeping at 1 a.m. when we suddenly heard a sound and found the fire on top of my tent. The tent next to me was burning and the fire was spreading to my tent. I woke up my seven daughters and we ran out. It was a catastrophic night. Look at this child. I have another child, along with my young daughters. We had to run for our lives. Some people were burned, others were wounded by shrapnel. Our tent was burned down. We were sleeping when we heard an explosion and saw the fire burning in the area. We first ran with the children and then returned to save those who remained in the tents. This man here was killed and our neighbors were wounded. We started fighting the flames and called out for a fire brigade, but no one came to help us. This is a part of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital and the Deir el-Balah town in central Gaza Strip, where an Israeli airstrike hit this particular location at the hospital. As you might see on the camera, the amount of destruction right at this place. Tents were, uh, were, were, were populated by uh, displaced people who had uh, found the hospital as a shelter for them for several months now. And by the way, this is not the first time that Israeli airstrikes hit Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital. The Israeli airstrike on Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital is not the only Israeli airstrike in the middle area of the Gaza Strip. An Israeli airstrike on a shelter school in north of the Nusayrat refugee camp and central Gaza Strip in which uh, 22 people were reportedly killed, including women and uh, children. The scene yesterday was so horrible with fire ripping through the hospital and people extremely scared because of the explosions. This would mean that the Israeli army deliberately targeted the hospital. Yesterday, the Israeli army issued a statement suggesting the hospital is no longer a hospital. We would say that the hospital will keep as a hospital for today and for tomorrow, and we will continue to provide care for all our Palestinian people, including patients already in care and those being brought in. This situation goes with other developments across the Gaza Strip as the situation in northern Gaza Strip is getting worse uh, uh, hour by hour with many people being reportedly uh, uh, killed and injured because of uh, intensive Israeli airstrikes and bombardments on the northern Jabalia refugee camp where Israel has recently cordoned off the camp, the other towns near the camp, and separated them from the Gaza city, ordering the population over the northern Gaza Strip to evacuate immediately, as the Israeli uh, says it has some kind of military actions over the area. All right, a lot of birds here in Sunny Hill, but we're coming up on something. Look at the red head. What would that be? Is it a, a hen? Maybe? 
I'm sure it's going to take off here in just a minute, or it might be a turkey buzzard. Let's keep getting him on the video. See how close I can get. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. All right, well, we did pretty good. We, we snuck on him a little bit. All right, I'm absolutely shocked. He's just staying right there on that limb. He flew up there. Let's see if, see if he takes off here in a minute. Not even looking at me. Boy, that is one ugly bird, isn't it? That's a turkey vulture. Oh, man. All right, this is what I'm talking about. Look at all these little birds. You'll see them start flying around here in just a minute. Look at them. One, two, three, four. There goes one. There's one right there. There they go. There goes another one. Let's get over here and see how close we can get. There they go. They're taking off. Man, I tell you, the birds are out today. Look at them back here. Wow. Crazy. We're getting close to this one. There he is right there. 